uh, G's it's uh, facing. However, the accelerometer is subject to jitter and noise, as you can see. Um, this red line is the accelerometer output. Uh, this is a unitless um, graph of values over time, where the red is the uh, accelerometer and the green is the common output. Um, in this demo, we are uh, subjecting the accelerometer to uh, dramatic jitter to show um, the effects of the Kalman filter. Uh, the Kalman filter is applied to the accelerometer output angle and the gyroscope angle, as well in the sideline plane, as well as the digital compass and gyroscope angle in the uh, Here you can see the dramatic jitter introduced and how the Kalman filter um, levels off uh, orientation. Now to uh, Matt to talk about Bluetooth. For connectivity with a smartphone, we use the uh, National Semiconductor LMX 983 Bluetooth module. Uh, this device was ideal because it first provided us with a development board which is easy to interface through uh, URSCI with our uh, microprocessor development board. But it was also ideal because it's default design. It allows us to place it in transparent mode when it's connected from the smartphone, which allows us to directly send our data packets through uh, the Bluetooth radio to our smartphone. Uh, so in essence, it works simply as cable replacement. So it's really turning a cable system into a wireless system. Um, it also was highly integrated, so with the chip itself included our radio, our antenna, um, a crystal oscillator. Uh, and we use that serial port profile link to establish communications. And this allows us also to maintain, should we not be getting information, the smartphone introduces an algorithm to reconnect to our device so that the user does not have to interact with it directly. All wireless communication is, is kept, established, and maintained automatically. And we'll talk a little more about uh, our power and then the algorithm for our smartphone. I'm going to pass off the mic. Matt? All right, so um, Power AMG, we have selected a 3.7 volt, 2500 milliamp hour lithium ion polymer battery. Reasons for the selection were for its high energy density, its desirable size and weight for our energy prototype. And um, the call is as designed to power the system up to 18 hours, as Sean had mentioned earlier. That way, the last six hours will be for recharge, totaling up to 24 hour use. Um, below is the charging circuit right here. And, and uh, it starts off by taking a 5 volt input, input source converted from a wall adapter. And, okay. And, um, and uh, let's see. It regulates our batteries over here, and basically it is, it's going to be charged up to 4.2 volts. And once it reaches that volt, the MOSFET will turn off, notifying the user it's fully charged. And the current's regulated at a max of 5 to 50 milliamps. Um, this is determined by choosing the appropriate sensors to do it. 220 milliamps, I believe. And, Finally, the capacitor here, uh, we selected a 0.2 microfarad uh, capacitor for the safety timer, which is described here in the graph over here on the right. Uh, it's just divided into three phases. First off, it, it's going to go through a preconditioning of phase. It's going to bring the voltage up to a safety level. And finally, it's going to bring the current up to 5 or 50 milliamps to go through the fast charging phase. And eventually, as you can see here, this is the voltage over here. And the current over here is So once the, current, once the voltage reaches its maximum range, current will start to die off, and within six hours, the battery will be fully charged. And uh, to miniaturize our breadboard, or rather the output unit, as we call it, which is the breadboard and the development board uh, prototype, we have designed a schematic here. So it's complex, but here's the microcontroller, the gyroscopes over here, the accelerometer, the digital compass, and et cetera, et cetera. And um, after, once the schematics have been finalized, um, we have designed a PCB layout here. It's, the, it's divided into two boards here. This is a two by two and a half inch board, and this is the uh, two, uh, two inch by half an inch board. Excuse me, or two and a half by half inch board. Excuse me. Sorry, two inch by half an inch board. And um, they're connected by a 90 degree header over here, and this is what the final product looks like. Currently, it's going through functional testing as we speak, and we're getting progress as we, as we speak. And Professor Little, our customer, has talked to us about possible uh, work in the future, so we're going to discuss that and see what more we can do. And I'll get passed out to start, so. uh, As mentioned before, the communication between the AMDs and the smartphone is over a Bluetooth connection. In order to interface the uh, smartphone software with the uh, Bluetooth hardware embedded within the smartphone, uh, we're using an open source .NET compatible uh, Bluetooth library called 32.net. The algorithm flowchart shown here is the algorithm we're using to manage the automated communication between the AMDs and the smartphone. And just to go over it really quick, uh, first, the uh, client is set to the discover mode. 
It searches for the MAC address of the AMDs, and if they're not found, the initial reconnect timer is enabled. If they are found, uh, you disable the initial reconnect timer and attempt to connect to the client as well as get the net network stream from the client. If it is not successful, enable the reconnect timer to repeat the connect and guest stream attempts. Uh, if it is successful, disable the reconnect timer and enable the web service and data collection timers. Once in the data collection timer tick event handler, the read data function is, co is called and checks if there is data available in the network stream. Uh, if there is no data in the network stream, the function returns a blank array and the no data counter is incremented. The no data counter is used to determine if the connection has been lost. Uh, if the no data counter reaches four, the client object is disposed and recreated and the reconnect timer is enabled. If the counter is not at four, the data collect timer tick is called again. Online. If there is data within the network stream, the data is read, analyzed, and applied to the application, and the data collect timer tick is called again. Online. The figure on the top left of the screen is the AMD configuration settings interface. Uh, this allows the user to select the number of AMDs as well as where on the body the yeah, AMDs are located, corresponding to the uh, uh, example positions shown in the left of the image. Uh, the figure on the bottom right hand of the screen is the system configuration settings interface, which allows the user to modify the sampling interval as well as the angle in which the feedback is given to the wear. The graphical view in the top left corner of the screen is, uh, displays the analyzed data in a graphical format. Um, a point to note about this form is that uh, the x-axis is a static time interval of one minute. Uh, this is because uh, if the sampling rate of our <coughs> If the sampling rate of our uh, system is three seconds or less per sample, the data values are averaged before they're plotted on the graph, uh, since the time interval between each point is only six seconds. Uh, the figure on the bottom right hand of the screen is the model view, uh, which displays the analyzed data as an image corresponding to the wear's current <coughs> positions. Uh, the sagittal angle is the side view of the body, and the transverse angle is the top down view of the body. Uh, the top uh, image is the uh, web interface for our system. Uh, the user um, is prompted to select the date, which is populated in the drop-down list box from the, uh, of all unique dates in our database. Um, once the user selects the date, they're prompted to input a time interval, which is an army time, um, and they select which data points they actually want to see on the graph. Upon clicking the view data button, the graph shown here is a sample of one of the graphs that's shown. Um, and the pink angle is the sagittal, the pink points are the sagittal angles, uh, the green points are the transverse angles, the solid black line is the temperature. Okay, so um, this is the cost breakdown of one AMD unit, as we speak. Uh, we were to miniaturize it. Um, the total came out to be $320, and more significant cost came from the two PCB boards, about $100 over there, and the gyroscopes, about $80, and other various sensors. So that's And this is a pie chart describing the cost from the previous slide. So again, gyroscopes and PCB boards pay the majority of the cost. But um, our requirement was that the cost had to be within five hundred dollars So call it a success. It's both in a range. And this is our quad chart summarizing our presentation. I'd like to thank you for attending our presentation. Now I'd open up the public for some questions. Uh, what did you make any simplified model for for the system that you have in order to do the column of filtering, or what what order uh, of systems did you assume? Is it linear? Non -linear? Uh, yes, it's linear. Linear. Yeah, so it's a yeah, two by two meters. Two by two meters for the two yep. position. Yeah. And uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, there are some smart sensors. This is just information um, that you could avoid perhaps column of filtering for bending sensors. That is marked. I don't know whether you are aware of it. So there are some materials that when you bend, uh, according to the bending, you can just uh, identify how much angle, and then you can use a microcontroller to use that sensing information to do this, uh, eliminating the column feature. Questions? Yeah. The, uh, the you get a digital compass, a gyroscope, and the accelerometers. 